Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our week eight lecture. So you've made it now halfway through the semester, which is great, and you survived the mid-session break. And so now we're here back in week eight, um, back into our stats lectures. So congratulations on coming back for more stats. So the point of this week's lecture is really just to try and take a bit of a sort of taking stock of where we've got to thus far um, and hopefully to re-emphasize um, or to go over some of the really important concepts that we've covered so far. So there's no new content in this lecture, but rather it's just trying to revise the concepts that we've got to already, going over a couple of new examples, but applying the same statistical test that we've learned previously. First thing I want to say is that it's very windy today when I'm recording this, so if you hear incredibly loud gusts of wind outside, I apologise for that. Unfortunately, I can't control it. Um, so our lecture outline. The first thing we're going to do with the first lot of slides is to just recap some of the important concepts, some of the fundamental concepts that we've talked about in the weeks leading up until when we started our statistical testing. Um, because hopefully now that we've done a couple of different statistical tests, i.e. the three different kinds of t-tests that we've done, hopefully coming back to those more important or fundamental concepts, they might make a bit more sense to you now that we've done the practical statistical testing. So that's the first thing we're going to do. We're then going to talk a little bit about when each test that we've talked about is appropriate. So how do you know which kind of test is the right one to pick in any individual circumstance? And then we'll go over the three different kinds of t-tests that we've talked about in the session so far. So we start off with the one sample t-test, we'll then move on, on to the paired t-test, and then finish off with the independent samples t-test. And then at the end of today, I'll talk again about how you know which test to pick of those three different t-tests. Okay, so starting our recap, um, we're starting off with a slide back from week two, week two, slide seven, as it says up the top there. Um, and at this point, we were talking about the distinction between a sample and a population. And this is a really important distinction to make because it helps you understand the role that inferential statistical testing plays in the research process. So remember that the sample is the group of people that you actually collect data from, whereas the population is the broader group of people who you're interested in understanding. So ideally, the first thing you would do would be to set your population of interest. And then based on that population, you generate your sample or select your sample through some kind of sampling method like random sampling. So you might randomly select a subset of people from your population who make up the sample. And the sample are the people who actually give you the data um, that you're analyzing using your statistical tests. Remember that the research questions that we have, so these broader questions that we're interested in, those always apply to the population. So the thing that we're interested in finding out about is our population. I'm interested in, say, all people in Australia who suffer from depression or all students who are studying at university. So the broader population is always who the research question is about, but the sample are the people that you're actually collecting data from. And based on the analysis that you do of that data, you then make generalizations or conclusions back to your wider population. So that's a really important distinction to make. Um, and as I said before, the distinction between the population and the sample really is the basis of the inferential statistical methods that we're using, we're talking about all throughout the session. So the idea behind needing statistical tests is to be able to see how strong the evidence of any particular effect is in our sample, and therefore how likely it is that it's reflecting something real that's going on in our population. The next thing that I want to talk about are three different kinds of hypotheses. So we've talked about three different sorts of hypotheses throughout the session so far. And I know it can be really confusing to understand why they're different. So that's why I thought it'd be worth going over these again today. So the first one is your research hypothesis. And the research hypothesis is the specific prediction that you make that comes at the end of, say, the introduction of a research paper. Um, and that's the prediction about what you think you will find or what you think might happen during your study or during your experiment. So that's your research hypothesis. And then we've got two different kinds of what's called statistical hypotheses. And these are our null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. And remember that the null hypothesis, the specific form of the null hypothesis in terms of how it's expressed, will differ from test to test. And every different statistical test we've covered so far, I've told you what the specific null hypothesis is for that individual test. 
But in general, what the null hypothesis says, or the kind of thing that it's predicting, is that there is no effect. No difference between the groups if we're looking at group differences, no relationship if we're looking at relationships between variables, no change over time if we're looking at change over time. It's essentially saying that there's nothing going on, there's no effect, there's nothing to be found. The word null in null hypothesis means nothing. And the secondary kind of statistical hypothesis is always the opposite to the null, and that's called the alternate hypothesis. And that always says that there is some effect that there is some difference between the groups if we're talking about differences between groups, there is some relationship if we're talking about relationships between variables, there is some change over time if we're talking about change over time, there's something going on. And remember that both of these things are necessary for our statistical analyses, but the research hypothesis is the thing that you will see in those research papers or those academic papers. That's the specific prediction that you make. So to give you the example that I used back in week two, let's say we're talking about PAL attendance and your final grade for PSYC 105. So my research hypothesis might be that the more PAL sessions that a student attends, the better your final grade is. And remember that your research hypothesis in terms of psychology is always a directional hypothesis. And that means that I'm always predicting what direction the effect is going to be. So here the direction is that the more PAL sessions you attend, the better your grade is. That there's a positive relationship between PAL sessions and 105 grade. The null hypothesis in this instance would be to say that there's no relationship between PAL attendance and 105 grade, whereas the alternate hypothesis is saying that there is some relationship. It doesn't say that there's a positive relationship. It doesn't say that there's a negative relationship. It just says that there is some relationship. And remember that the research hypothesis is always directional. The alternate hypothesis for our purposes, for 105 and for the large majority of psychology research, the alternate hypothesis is not directional and the null hypothesis is also not directional. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about um, really formed the basis for the inferential test that we started talking about in week five. So in week five, we kind of got into the conceptual detail behind statistical testing. Um, and a really important concept for you to understand, to understand why, why we need statistical testing, why we need this inferential testing that we do, is the idea of sampling variability. So I said to you a couple of slides ago that the sample are the group of people who you pick who are representative of your population, and they're the people who actually give you the data. And what we're interested in, in terms of a research question, is always at the population level. So we're always interested in understanding whatever our effect is in the population. And we use the sample to represent the population. So we think that if there's an effect in our population, we will see it by looking at whether the effect exists in our, in our sample. Um, but the important point to realise there is that there's always going to be variation between samples. So the illustration here shows that in our population we have a mean score of 3, doesn't matter what the mean is, but let's just say we have some mean score of 3. And if we were to take four person samples, the mean score in each of those groups isn't necessarily going to be the same as the mean score in our population, the mean score of 3. So you see the first group has a mean score of 3, the second group has a mean score of 2, the third group has a mean score of 4, the fourth group has a mean score of 3, and then a mean score of 1, a mean score of 4, etc, etc. And that's what we call sampling variability. The fact that people vary, people are different, not everybody is the same. And therefore, even if there is a real effect in our population, we're going to see some variability or some differences from sample to sample. So no one sample is perfectly representative of whatever the effect is at the population level. And because of that, we need to use these things called p-values to see how big the effect is in our sample and how consistent that effect is in order to see how likely it is that it reflects a real effect in the population. So how likely it is that the effect that I'm seeing in my sample 
is reflecting a similar kind of an effect in the population. It's never going to be exactly the same, but if your sample has been, has been chosen appropriately, say through random sampling methods or some other appropriate sampling methods, then your sample should be representative of the population. And therefore the characteristics in your sample should be similar to the same characteristics in the wider population. The next thing we started talking about in week five was the idea of null hypothesis significance testing. And this is where we kind of put each of those different concepts we've talked about so far all together in terms of understanding the point of doing a t-test or the point of running a correlation. So in short, what this process of null hypothesis significance testing is doing is to try and analyze data that we've obtained from our sample in order to learn something about the wider population. But because the sample is only a subset of the population, we're going to need an inference or a generalization that we make from the sample to a population because we never get all the information from our population that we possibly could get because that's just not feasible, it's not doable. And I also said to you back in week five that the process of null hypothesis significance testing is quite a conservative approach. And that means that we start off by assuming that our null hypothesis is true and try to find evidence to the contrary, try to be able to disprove or to reject that null hypothesis. And what that actually entails in terms of the process of doing this significance testing is to summarize our data throughout whichever way is appropriate for the kind of data and the kind of hypothesis we're talking about and compute what's called a test statistic. And the test statistic is reflecting to a certain extent the effect that we're analyzing. So that effect could be a difference between groups, that effect could be a relationship between variables. And what we get with our test statistic is what's called a p-value. And that p-value, p stands for probability, that p-value tells us the probability or the likelihood that we've obtained that particular test statistic if our null hypothesis is true. So if our null hypothesis of no effect, of no relationship, is true. And remember that we can reject the null hypothesis if our p-value is small enough or we cannot reject the null hypothesis, but we can never actually conclude that we accept the null hypothesis. So going back on that process, the idea of using probability and inferential processes to see how likely it is that we've obtained this particular test statistic, this value of our t-statistic, say, if our null hypothesis is true. And how we're able to do that is by using information about the normal distribution, which is what that curve is down the bottom right hand corner there. So we have information about how likely it is, what the probability is of obtaining a particular test statistic of any kind of value if the null hypothesis is true. We have that information and therefore we can compute the, that probability level for any given test statistic. So we, when we're running a particular statistical test, we can obtain that p-value and that p-value can be used to either reject or to not reject the null hypothesis. The smaller the p-value is, the more likely we reject the null hypothesis. The bigger the p-value is, the less likely we reject the null hypothesis. And remember that the actual value of the p-value itself is actually a probability and it's telling us the probability or the likelihood that we've got this particular test statistic, we've obtained this particular value, if the null hypothesis of no effect is true. And the bigger our test statistic, the bigger in size the number is, the smaller the p-value, the bigger the test statistic, the bigger the effect, the less likely it is that we've obtained this particular effect if there's no effect in the population, Therefore, the more likely it is that we've obtained this effect because there is a real effect in the population that our sample is reflecting. And therefore, the smaller our p-value is, the more evidence there is for the alternate hypothesis. And um, that's just there to kind of add a bit of color to our lecture, um, but remember that because what we're using is a process of inference, process of using probability to help us, we never actually know if the effect is true in the population or not. All we can do is see how strong the evidence is or how likely it is that it's true. 
And that's a really important concept that we're going to be coming back to at the end of the semester when I talk about kind of the limitations in any one individual study's results and how it's possible that any one individual study brings us or kind of puts forward the actually the wrong information or the wrong results. So that's a really important concept that we'll come back to at the end of the session. The next thing we did was talk about the hypothesis testing procedure, so how we actually go about doing this process of hypothesis testing. And I said to you that there are two different ways represented by the left hand side and the right hand side of this diagram. The left hand side process involves actually calculating the test statistic, say the t-statistic by hand, using what's called a table of critical values to find the critical test statistic, compare your obtained test statistic with that critical test statistic and use that to see whether you reject or not reject the null hypothesis. That's if you're doing it by hand. And it's important for you guys to understand that process because I think it helps you understand, say, what the T statistic is actually representing. But when you're doing these things yourself as a student or as a researcher, what you're going to be doing more often than not, and particularly through your degree here at Macquarie, is using a computer program to calculate these test statistics for you and to give you a precise p-value, and you use that p-value to either reject or not reject the null hypothesis. So these are kind of parallel processes. You do either the hand calculation way or the computer program way. You don't do both of them at the same time. But I've shown you both of them throughout the previous week's lectures just to show you the two different ways of doing it.